Well, welcome, and thanks for joining us for Salty Church Online. My name is Jacob, and I'm so glad that you're here today. And I'm excited for our time together online. We got some great songs planned for today, and a wonderful message in our series called Flip. So right now, why don't you jump into the chat and say hi. Let us know where you're logging in from. You can also take this time to give us a like on Facebook or if you're on our YouTube channel, like and subscribe. And for all of us, share this service with someone else and invite them to church online. Well, we're going to go into our time of worship, so let's sing together. Welcome, Salty Church. Thanks for joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. Whether you're here in person or online, we want to welcome you. Let's all stand and sing together. Here we go.
today, let's lift up some praise. Jesus, as we reflect on the great things that you've done, it gives us hope, it gives us strength to go forward because our future is in your hands, Lord, and we know we can trust you with that. Amen. Let's sing this out. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, together just one word you hear what's broken inside me just one word and you revive every dream amen just one touch i feel the power of heaven just one greater things as we sing this out I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like his power there's nothing that I can't do there's no Continue to declare these truths over our lives.
Come on, let's sing it out. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, let's lift it up. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, I know it's true. I'm not afraid. the God of the mountains is the God of the valleys and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me
welcome back and thanks for singing with us. I hope you enjoyed your time of worship and I want to say welcome to Salty Church Online. We're so glad that you're here and we want to get to know you and help you take your next steps of faith and connect to the ministries of Salty. The best way to do that is go to salty.org and fill out our digital connect card and let us know how we can serve you and help you in your journey of faith. Well, it's beach season and I can think of no better way to be at the beach than right now celebrating baptism. That's right, baptism is coming up June 6th following our 1030 service. So if you live in the area of Flagler Beach, Orman, or New Smyrna, we would love to have you a part of our uh, baptism time on June 6th following the 1030 service. Go to salty.org. Fill out the Digital Connect card. Let us know. I am interested in baptism. And we'll be in touch with you this week and help you get set, set up for that. And uh, it's going to be a great time celebrating. Well, also, this summer, um, I want to encourage you, as you kind of plan out your summer, you're looking towards um, what kind of vacations you're going to take, kids going to camp, things like that. Why not take a week out of your summer and go on a missions trip with Salty? We have some great trips coming up to the Dominican Republic and to Costa Rica. I wanna encourage you to be a part of that. And once again, you can go to salty.org and fill out our digital connect card. And there's a tab that says missions trip info. Click that, let us know you're interested. And our missions director will be in touch with you this week with more information about our missions trips. Well, every week here at Salty Church, we take a couple minutes out uh, for connection time. And if you're new to Salty, what that is, is a time for you to quite simply get out of your seat, go grab a cup of coffee, maybe jump into the chat, say hi. You could also go to salty.org, fill out a prayer request. Or if you have some juice and crackers at home, you could take some time to celebrate what Jesus did on the cross through communion. And finally, during our connection time, a great way to connect God and to Salty Church is through giving. And we have a give tab at salty.org. I want to also just say thank you. Thank you to each one of you who give regularly to the mission of rescuing and empowering disciples for Jesus. Your giving makes a difference and your giving matters. I want to say thank you for that. Well, we'll be right back in a couple minutes as we go back into our series, Flip. So let's connect.
Yeah, it's important. <clears throat> the virtues of service and sacrifice are powerful. And so Monday is, would be the day that we stop and honor those who paid the ultimate price. I think it's important to do. And today what we'll do is we'll look at a scripture that, coincidentally or not, really kind of references those virtues, sacrifice and service. And so um, I think uh, tying these together and making application out of it can be really important. Um, and that's what we want to do. Um, welcome to Salty Church. I'm glad that you are here. Whether you're here in Ormond or you're watching online, we are honored that you would join us. Uh, for the folks who are in Flagler and New Smyrna in the same way, we welcome uh, that we are in this place, uh, diving into God's word, worshiping together, that we might be impacted in some way by him. And that's what that's all about. And so here we are in uh, this series. This is week two of four on uh, the series called Flip. It's kind of like flipping stuff upside down. It's why Philippi up there. Uh, it's based on the book of Ephesians. I mean, not Ephesians. Yeah, it says Ephesians. Uh, Philippians, which would be the next one. Um, so Philippians, flip, Philippians. And that um, as Paul writes this letter to this church in Philippi that we might dig into it as well and take some application out of that. Uh, it's it's uh, Philippians is the, is the letter to the city. Uh, flip is like, man, just reversing or inverting. I think it's important. We'll see that uh, <clears throat> as we go through. And so every week... We want, I really want to encourage you to follow along, pull your phone out, look at the app, uh, read through it during the week, read through it now, whatever you want to do. I really want to encourage you to be doing this so that it's, you have ownership of it. My job is just to present and to um, challenge you in this. And so last week was chapter 1. Uh, key verse in chapter 1 was verse 21, where as Paul is writing from uh, prison in this uh, confinement, not sure what's going to be next in his life, kind of thinking back, keeping perspective about his life, keeping an eternal perspective. He says this in verse 21. He says, for, uh, for me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better, which sounds crazy, right? It's like... Most of us are all about survival and doing what I can to live. And he's like, you know what? If I don't make it out of this, fine. I'm good. Then I'm going to heaven. I'm happy. Uh, but if I do, they let me out of here and I keep living, then that's great too because then I can continue to, to serve for the sake of Christ. And so that was really the uh, key focus for chapter 1. That's what we worked on last week. And then with that eternal perspective about it, keeping eternity in mind, I think is really helpful as we consider the things of today. So it's really easy to get caught up in the stress of today. But having an eternal perspective is going to make a difference. We turn to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, Paul goes on and begins to uh, really challenge us in, I think, a really heavy way. You could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just studying chapter 2. It's a, uh, it's a bit of a poetic part of this letter. Uh, but you would, I would also say it's probably maybe one of the more powerful uh, scriptures maybe in all of the New Testament, chapter 2 is. So go back and look at it. There's a lot there. Uh, but what really stood out to me as I was reading and studying was uh, verse 5. And that's where I want to spend some time today and really drive home uh, what I feel like uh, we need for, um, for, for out of the scripture for us uh, personally. So chapter five, uh, verse 5, as Paul is beginning really the the heart of his letter, which starts in verse 6, he says this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus. And so what I wanted to do was spend time in this part, in your relationships with one another. So that's where we're going to really, because as I'm going through it, I'm like, this is what we need to be doing. This is um, powerful, I believe. Uh, it could be transformational, but also maybe one of the more difficult things you could do. To really apply this scripture in this way, thinking about your relationship. In your relationship with one another, have the same attitude, the same mindset as Jesus. We'll dig into that. But to make this relevant, what I want to do is invite you to grab your card. We've provided these cards to everyone. To everybody except for those who are watching like at home or driving down the road or whatever on the internet and watching from there. Uh, if you're on one of our campuses, you have one of these cards. And it's the flip card, and um, we made use of that last week. I want to encourage you to um, consider doing the same thing here. So on the card for today, on the front of that card, what I want to do is to name some of the relationships, right? So 
in your relationships with some other people have the same attitude as Jesus. So what are the relationships? Now, you can put a lot of names on that card. You got a lot of people you know, give or take, right? But here's what I want to do. I want to jump into the deep end with this and really make this uh, practical and relevant. I would say the names we put on the front of that card are these. Name two, three, four of maybe your most difficult relationships. Right, we can be easy, like you can name the top three people you love the most in the world, right? And then you could say, well, I, I got to have the attitude of Jesus when I hang out with the people that I love the most. Well, that would be a piece of cake, right? There's, I mean, we got that, that's easy. Okay, but what about the most difficult relationships? And that's where this immediately gets challenging. But that's why you're here. You want to you you get a sense of what God has for you and, and really some transformational uh, uh, truth. I believe this is it. So let's make it relevant right off the top. In your relationships with who? The more difficult people that you got to wrestle. And it can't be hard to figure out what those names are. And if it's somebody you're sitting next to, just fake it and put somebody else's name on there. <laughs> or spell their name backwards or something so they don't know. I don't know. Because that's, that might happen, actually. Um, so, so, yeah, let's take Scripture and let's make it the, as relevant as it can be. P powerful chapter, powerful truth. As we'll look at it here, what are the relationships that are most difficult, the ones that are more challenging? And then we're going to apply the Scripture to those relationships. So in, 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 in with the names that you put on that card, we need to have... And, and, the same attitude as Jesus. And I know that's difficult because you, you get a sense of what's coming. You're like, there's two or three people that I'm stuck with, either married to or related to or family or working with or, I mean, there's people that you just got to deal with, right? And then, and then you know what's coming here is you got to think about your attitude with those people and your attitude at times is not anything like Jesus' attitude. So you know this is going to be hard, I know. But I think this is uh, why it's important. And so what is that? You might take a few minutes uh, now and write on the card. Um, I think it's really important to make this tangible. You know, a lot of times folks will come to church, they're looking for like a, a broad-based uh, experience that feels nice or whatever. I want it to be pointed and articulate and, um, and absolutely relevant. So what are the names? That makes this real. Let's focus on that. So, verse 5 says, in your relationship and the ones that you're writing down, have the mindset of Jesus. So now let's take a few minutes, and as Paul is writing, he's challenging us. He, he's like, all right, so what comes after the colon there is, and let me describe to you Jesus' attitude. Here's the attitude that you need to copy with and, and to, to mimic and to apply into your life with these people. He says this, verse 6, he says this, Jesus, who... Being in very nature, God, so Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, the Trinity, all of that. Jesus is in heaven with God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, so this is, I, I underline that word because it's kind of the flip. It's like he, he could have stayed there. He could have just been the God in heaven. But he flips the script to a certain extent. Rather than stay in there, he makes himself nothing. By taking the very nature of servant, being made in human likeness. And so we have this huge shift where God, essentially Jesus, um, joins humanity on earth. So he leaves the privileges of heaven. He doesn't hold on to all that he has available. Rather, he becomes. And so ultimately what Paul is saying is as we begin thinking about our relationships with other people, this is like monumental. We can't even like, we can't overestimate how big of a deal this is. Like I was trying to like wrap my head around some of that in terms of like what this would mean and like, like the extreme going from like king of heaven, creator, all the way to being born in a, in a barn or a cave of some sort, you know, in the first century um, as a essentially poor carpenter family, right? You're like, what is that extreme like? So I'm like, I couldn't even begin to think of like examples of it hardly. So like if you were in the military, for instance, you, you might think like four-star general is at the top, right? Big time, right? Four-star general and you got private. Can you ever imagine a four-star general pulling the stars off of his collar and I'm going to put a stripe on there? Like all the way from the very top to the very bottom, right? Never going to happen. 
And I'm not talking about like for a half an hour or a week or two, but like completely leave his position to go all the way to the bottom. It's like I can't even, like I don't even know if that quite does it. It's like um, you a like CEO of like, you know, whether it's Apple or Google or whatever, like multi-trillion dollar company. And then all of us just, I'm going to leave all that, leave the salary, leave the privilege, and take an entry-level position at minimum wage. It's like the, the extremes of that. I can't even imagine. It's like what, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> like Donald Trump, like leaving everything and like signing it off. And then he's going to become like a, one of those guys that's shining shoes on the street corner. Like the extreme of that. Or like the president of the United States, Joe Biden, is going to become a dishwasher at Denny's or something. Like, the, like I can't even, you can't even begin to grab what, what, Jesus, what, what Paul is saying here. It's like, as you think about your attitude, your attitude needs to be the same with Jesus, who gave it all up, everything, to become nothing for the sake of someone else. And then, and then it gets harder. It gets even more difficult. Verse 8 says, and, and being found in human appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient God of heaven doesn't have to be obedient to anything or anybody. He doesn't, he doesn't have to do what he's told, period. He's the king of the universe who spoke creation into existence and yet chooses to become obedient to those who would put him on a cross. Died. Like, so Paul is really painting this picture of giving up everything for the benefit of. You know, it's just that idea of... Um, of, you know, of who. He's, he's given it up. He's becoming obedient to death, death on earth. And, and he's doing this for, like, the king of creation becomes equal with people and he allows them to treat him like a criminal and put him on a cross. Yeah, it's like, it's like his, um, his authority, his privileges, his power are all set aside uh, um, for the sake of an eternal relationship with broken people. Like, he does all of that for the sake of those who deserve it the least. And, 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 like, as we think about, like, God is going to, you know, heal and forgive me, forgive me of my sins. Like, it makes sense that, that, that you would be restored to relationship with God because you're not all that bad of a person, right? We kind of think that way. But, but Jesus did what he did for the most broken people. And so as Paul is talking about and challenging us that in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus who did that. Okay, so it's like you can't, it, the extreme element of this, this truth is, is extremely difficult. But nonetheless, I think it's, it's important to consider that Jesus, who is doing all of these things, did it for the sake of those, for, for the, the most broken people. And we need to be doing the same. That, that Jesus is, it's like, gave up all for the sake of eternal relationship with them and me. Like, breathing is not as important as relationship for eternity. And so what Paul does here in, in chapter 2 is just draws out this amazing, like, the extreme one into another and says, as a disciple of Jesus, you need to live like him. And it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's so intense and so big that it almost seems hopeless. But nonetheless, the question is, is it true and does it work? You know, and, 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 and what I do know is that it's without question, maybe the more, one of the more, some of the most difficult things we ever have to do is treat other people in the way that Jesus would have them treated, you know, to give up, to sacrifice. And we, and you do it, we do it all the time, especially if you're, if you're, if you got kids, I mean, period, right? The things that we do for our children, right? To give up the sacrifice to provide, it's difficult. And what reward do we get? You know, uh, and, and we, can, we can joke around about it a lot, but, but, but really, seriously, it gets, like Christy and I, as we, we've been talking about that off and on lately, is that um, we've got six kids, two of them we adopted, and I was in the back earlier talking to her, and I was like, how many, like, foster kids have we had? And we're like, <laughs> 12. So on top of the six, there were 12 others who came in and out over the years. And uh, some for just a few weeks, some a little bit longer, all of that kind of stuff. And without question, it is the most uh, costly, difficult daily sacrifice 
that, that we could ever imagine. And, and, and painful, more painful than rewarding. And so it gets, I like to be real about it, it is hard. And how often is it that, that we give up, we sacrifice, and we do for others, whether we're related to them or not, and it's difficult, and oftentimes it's like, well, you know what I want? I want to be recognized. I want to be rewarded for my efforts, right? Don't you? Like as you give, as you sacrifice, as you pay the price for other people, so many times those other people don't appreciate it, don't, don't care, and, they, you know, and, and there just seems to be no reward in it, and yet... What Paul is saying is in all of our relationships, we need to operate this way. And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of getting tired of that sometimes, right? And yet it's the calling that we have as disciples to do what Jesus did. And so where, what's the reward in it for me? What's the, you know, that's the selfishness in me, right? Like, what do I get out of this? But is it true that Paul is challenging us for this reason? Is it true that Paul wants us to follow Jesus' example in the most difficult relationships for the purpose of us understanding what Jesus did? And I probably should take that us out. I probably should make that Paul wants you. Paul wants me to follow Jesus' example in the most difficult relationships I have for the purpose of me understanding what Jesus did for me. Is that part of the reason for this? Maybe it's not all the reason, but, but is that true? You know, for me, I, I want my actions, and every time I'm humble and sacrifice and I serve, and I want to be rewarded, now would be nice. <laughs> or, okay, maybe, maybe not now, but soon. I want to see the upside of this. And yet, what you read in Philippians 2 is Jesus' actions in humility. What did it earn him initially? Dishonor and death. That's what he got. And I'm like, I, this is, is there anything more difficult than this kind of thing? And so whether we're talking about parenting or friends or bosses or neighbors or whatever, in our relationships, we want to follow this pattern of Jesus. And it's like, I don't know. But to be obedient to this. Is important, And we know that it's not without reward. I mean, you read the whole chapter, right? You keep on going where Jesus does all this. He's obedient to death, even death on the cross. But then we see verse 9, therefore God exalted him. And I'm like, there we go. A little bit of like reward in this. So Jesus, after it's all done, of course we have Easter Sunday. You got the resurrection and then renewal and new life and all of that. But in the end, Paul tells us that God exalts Jesus to the highest place. And I think that, therefore, is because of his ultimate sacrifice, God exalts him to the highest place, gives him the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord, that's boss, that's king, put back into his rightful place. And so Jesus, in the ultimate sacrifice, is eventually elevated and lifted up. But I think what's important to understand and remember is, by whom? does he get elevated and restored and exalted? It's but by God. And I get, I get caught up in the temporary, right, in the momentary of things. And I want reward and I want recognition for what I did and I sacrificed and the things I poured. I, and I want it soon and I want it now. And I want my reward and acknowledgement by the, by the people that I'm helping. We'll just start with kids, right? I want recognition for what I've done for you for the last xyz number of years right i want and i need you to appreciate what i've done. and they can't of course can't possibly understand that and and when is there ever reward for any of that right and so many times i want the reward that comes from the people and what i think paul is reminding us about is that um who do you serve because if I'm wanting to be rewarded and recognized by the people around me, the most difficult relationships that I have, if I'm wanting that, then it's, is it, or, or am I, you know, am I, who are they? It's like, am I, to a certain extent, like, giving my life to them so that they will, I'm trusting the people around me for what it is that I need? I'm trusting people? Or is it really, you know, as I put myself at the center of the universe, it's about me? But what Paul, I believe, is saying is in your attitude with other people will have the same attitude as Jesus. And the, the focus has to be on eternity. And, and, and that God is the one who. 
And so you've got some names on the card. This is hard without question. You know, so I might think, like, if you were to flip the card over and maybe rewrite that a little bit, you know, is there anybody, like, who's at the top of that list maybe that you have not been treating with the same attitude that Jesus might treat them because they don't deserve it, right? And in which case, to what extent do I ever deserve any good that comes my way because... And so as you think about that list, you might flip it over. Is there anyone that, that this there that you maybe need to rethink that? And, in, in, and especially in light of the, uh, the scripture in Philippians 2. In fact, I actually skipped verse 3 on purpose because I didn't want to make it like super hard right out of the gate. But verse 3 says, and those people that are on this card do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value them above yourself. Not looking for your own interests but to theirs. Does, it's like, man, that's hard. Really difficult. So we're called in obedience to do it. Why? In obedience, we're called to have that attitude of Jesus. Why? So that they will get it, so that they will be, you know, recognize you, and so that they will, you know, elevate you because you're so good at, or is it about, my focus being on eternity. There's a um, there's an old traditional song that captures some of this for me as I was thinking through it. I'm going to put the song up there here in a second. It, um, we're not going to sing it though. We could. Um, there is a clapping part to this. You can do that if you want. Um, you'll recognize some of you will recognize not everybody, but many of you will recognize the the lyrics to this iconic song. Um, yeah, clap along in them if you need to. So uh, just, I think it speaks to some of this, yeah, at least in a fun way to start out. So no one told you life was going to be this way. Your job's a joke, you're broke, your love life's DOA. It's like you're always stuck in second gear when it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year. But, so uh, some of you guys reckon, most, many of you would recognize this, right, from the theme song of Friends. Um, it's, uh, I didn't say it was a church song. I said it's an older traditional song that gets stuck in your head sometimes when you hear it. Um, so, yeah, it's like doesn't, it kind of captures sometimes how you feel. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, it just really doesn't seem to matter. You know, it's like, ah. Uh. But, you know, the way the song goes, of course, is, you know, it's friends. And so I'll be there for you, right? I'll be there when, when, when you know, when the rain starts to pour. I'll be there for you when... You know, because like, I've been there before. I'll be there for you because, you know, you're there for me too. So this idea of friendship. But it, what struck me as I was going back over this, and I'm, it's almost silly, but nonetheless, I think we could baptize this chorus here. Um, to what extent do you, tr who do you trust to be there for you? Right? There's a, there are plenty of times I let people down. Plenty of times that my peop the, those closest to me let me down. Who do we trust? You know, it, it's really cute when, and, and it's awesome to think that you've got the right kind of five best friends that will never let you down no matter what. It's nice to think that way, but it's a really real where it's a, it makes for a good TV show, but not reality. So what if, what if we baptize the song and, and, you know, when you feel like no matter what you do, life is just going to get you down, that we remember that this, that what, what Philippians is even saying is, uh, what Paul's saying in Philippians is, who do you trust to be there for you? God says, I'll be there for you. You know, who do you, who do you trust when the rain starts to pour? Who's, who are you going to trust when, you know, oh, yeah, God, you've been there for, for me before. And, you know, I'll, I'll be there for you, God is saying, because I know we've got this relationship. It's not, a, you know, a, a bit of a risk with that little song there. But maybe if you hear it the next time, you might think about it a little differently. And, the, and the, maybe the bottom line for today is who do you trust to be there for you as you give and sacrifice and serve? Who is it you do it for but the one who will never let you down? So I want to encourage you to consider the names on that card, the more difficult relationships that you have and you got to deal with, and understanding that as you serve and as you sacrifice for their benefit, there, there may be some healing or even recognition, maybe, but maybe not. And then you do it anyways, because that's what 
God did for you. So I want to encourage you to take that card. Um, you might flip it over and make some notes on there and consider this question. This will be our reflection question. Something to talk about if you're here with somebody um, or to meditate on or maybe to take some notes on. But um, in what ways can you bring an eternal perspective to those most difficult relationships that you've written down? Because in the momentary, it's like you, when you think, like when, as I think about my kids, going through whatever is difficult today, you get so tired and frustrated because it's always difficult. Man, I need to keep a long-term perspective with my children. I want my kids to grow up to be uh, men and women of, of character the, who are disciples of Jesus as for the long haul, for decades. And so many times I get caught up in the moment of today and getting through the day. So maybe as we're dealing with whatever the difficult relationships are, in what ways can you bring an eternal perspective into that? And maybe that will help shift or change, and it may, may never change anything in anybody else, but it might change a whole lot in you. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here in this chapter. So take a minute, reflect on it, talk about it, write some things down, go back and read the whole chapter and apply that. And then after we've had some time to reflect on that, um, we'll come back and we'll close out. Let's do that. So as we get ready to go, question would be either you are king of your universe or he is. And this may be where the decision, this is maybe where it gets really difficult in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus because he gave and sacrificed all for me that I might live. And so we need to model that out to the rest of the world. It's not easy. So with that said, um, I hope that uh, you take this challenge, take it seriously, and I know that God will do some uh, work in you because of it. You guys uh, be careful out there. It's a crazy Memorial Day weekend, and it just started raining. Um, be careful out there, and I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be in the chapter three. You guys have a great day. Thank you.